everybody. Welcome to another Monday Night Live from Mammoth Music here on One More with Danny Coleman. And I am Danny Coleman, and uh, we are sponsored by Mammoth Music right here in beautiful downtown Red Bank, New Jersey, as well as Mr. Pizza Slice, Mammoth Street here in Red Bank, New Jersey, and Antoinette Boulangerie, uh, also in Red Bank, literally two doors down. Uh, they are the providers of this incredible array of pastries. Uh, Mr. Pizza Slice provides us with the pregame meal. How was the pizza there, Jerry? Good. Good? <laughs> Excellent. Connoisseur. You're con pizza <laughs> connoisseur. There you go. Uh, if there's something you might want to see on this program, please don't hesitate to email me. dcoleman.drice, D-R-I-C-E, that's dcoleman.drice, at gmail.com and I want to say hello to everybody on Long Canch uh, Long Canch Long Branch Cable Channel 20 say hello to you guys watching us at home um, this is uh, it's quite exciting Nash don't you think yeah. Nash it's big time exciting big time, big time exciting good, good good right Tom right yeah see that's the crew I got to get the crew involved <laughs> so for those of you at home that cannot see him Tom and, and Nash but they are you know and then we got Mike and Matt out in the control room. Karen's out there, or was out there. I'm not sure if she still is, but uh, Mario's here. Everybody's here tonight to bring you one more with Danny Coleman. And uh, they do a fine job at that. The ship does not sail without the crew. That's correct. Yeah. That's right. There could be a mutiny soon. <laughs> <laughs> but my guest this evening is, where are you from, anyway? I'm originally from New Brunswick, New Jersey. From New Brunswick. I lived in many places where New Brunswick was Okay. Born. And, uh, and unfortunately, in the, all the back and forth that I had with you and, and Bob prior to your appearance here tonight, there was no actual name pronunciation. So is it Hobley? Yes. Oh, there you go. So I had it right. So thank it's you, Sh <laughs> Sharif Hobley. Yes. Thank you very thank much you. for being Hobley all my life. So oh. <laughs> really <appreciate> <laughs> Usually if there's an E in there, it always makes an O long for some e. reason, right? <laughs> so y you uh, and you gr you were raised in New Brunswick? Um, I lived in New Brunswick till about fourth grade. Okay. And then we moved to Piscataway, where I okay. finished middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. And then I moved back to New Brunswick when I went to Rutgers College. Uh -huh. um, but I was actually, oddly enough, my I, camp, my dorm was on Bush Campus, which is in Piscataway. Um, <laughs> yeah, which was housed literally <laughs> across the street from the apartments I grew up in uh, in middle school <laughs> at that time. So, right. yeah, so I was like, very so familiar with the campus. It's already. really what, <laughs> what goes around comes around. For right? real. Uh, so when did you become a musician? Uh, day one, I was born a musician. I started playing piano at a very young age, uh, probably four or five. Played in church, uh, played drums in church. And then when I got to... Um, middle school I started playing in the school bands you know the concert band the wind ensemble and all these various bands playing drums as a drummer okay. I was primarily a drummer all the way through high school up into college and you know I played a little guitar I had a guitar but when I was a, a freshman in college was when I started to get serious about guitar what prompted that switch I wanted to be up front <laughs> now, now, as a drummer myself, I can relate to that. Like, is that why all of us at some point go through this phase where I want to teach myself how to play guitar? Because yeah. <laughs> we're tired of being stuck in the back, you know? <laughs> no, but, but all jokes aside, the drummer is the foundation of every band. So it was not to take anything away from drummers. I just right. always wanted to play guitar, you know, so I did oh, it. Good for you. And, uh, and you've been writing your own music for how long as well? Uh, ooh, for a, a very long time. Okay. I've always written. Um, I released my debut CD back in 05. And I'm ashamed to say that we haven't, until last year, released any other music officially um, since then. But my newest single, entitled Promise Me, is now out and available on iTunes and a, a plethora of other online sources. Good. Fantastic. Now, you, you are here tonight. Because in common, we have Mr. Bob Macon. Yes. And Bob has sent me many artists, and, and I, I thank you for uh, taking the time, because I know you're a very busy man. Oh, thanks for uh, having me, and God bless Bob for making the connection. He did, and um, I, you 
recently you just had a death in the family too, right? We kind of worked into all this too. We did. Um, it's actually a very, very close uh, member to the family, someone who I've always revered as an aunt for my entire life. And unfortunately, she passed. And yes, the, the wake was today actually, and the services are tomorrow. But I didn't feel right canceling on you at the last minute, so you know we're, we're still here. <laughs> now, hey, Nash. Now that is something for the show must go on, right? That's right. Tom <laughs> Nash. Wow, I, I thought it was. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I I almost want to like cut the show, and let you go. Oh no 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 no! no. <laughs> I, you know I, I, I. You know that should be. You should sh uh, serve as a shining example. I actually had musicians come on the radio show that I do who were touring mm -hmm. from the Midwest. And when they heard it was a two-hour program, oh, what are we going to talk about for two hours? One of them actually faked a death Oof. in their family. Wow. Their PR people contacted me. So in the middle of the interview, I looked at them and I said, I know you got to go because you had somebody pass away. And mm. They're like, no, 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 I could stay. Uh, oh, wait a minute! Now you want to talk to me for two hours, <laughs> you know? So and and here you are, and you actually have a situation where you shouldn't even be here, and you're here. So, thank you very much for that. Thank you. See, th that's something about commitment. If there's any kids watching at home, that's something about commitment. Um, I, I I appreciate it. I, you know, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, you're very welcome. But that's how we know each other through Bob. Yes, through Bob. Yeah. And uh, you're part of the Rock New Brunswick. Event. Yes, September tenth, tenth and, and 11th. there's there's yeah. a panel a couple of days before that that I'm also going to be. On. Oh, okay, you're one yeah. of the speakers. Yes. Oh, nice, yeah. very nice. Take uh, take everybody at home or watching, uh, take them through your musical career because you've got uh, quite a resume, actually. If, if I can remember it all, you know what they say. <laughs> If you can remember it, it ain't rock and roll. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> it's like the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Uh, well, um, growing up, uh, we had a family band called Smith Connection, my cousins and I. Uh, we used to do our Jackson 5 dance routines and, you know, play instruments, and that's where I started. That was the, the basis and the foundation of my okay. becoming and coming into being a real musician. Uh, by the time I got to middle school, I was playing in the school bands, as I mentioned before. By the time I got to high school, I was playing drums in all the bands, jazz band, uh, concert, wind ensemble, uh, marching band, played snare drum and marching band. Um, and then when I got to college, I kind of uh, left the, the school band situation alone and started getting into making my own music. I was in a rap group called The Heartbreaking Three, shout out to my boys. Um, and we were close to signing a, a, a rap record deal back then. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, as young knuckleheads, things got in the way, uh, street life, girls, whatever it was. And I was actually a full-time college student at that time, so I was concentrating on that. Um, and then I started playing out in the local New Brunswick scene, Court Tavern and uh, some of the places around town, but the Court Tavern was where I was de-virginized, if you will, to playing out in the night <laughs> in the bar scene. And the Court Tavern could be rough at times. Back <laughs> yeah, you know, sneaking in with my older mm -hmm. cousin's ID. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I did a show. This was when I was still doing hip hop, and um, I, my one of the TAs for my class, a good friend of mine now, Andre Chumley, and Bob Ramos and another guy, Ben, I forget Ben's last name, Davis, I want to say, Benjamin Davis, had a band called Rhythm Method. And I went up and did like a live band hip hop thing with them at the Court Tavern. Okay. And then shortly after that, uh, we formed a band called Spy Gods with myself, Bob Ramos, uh, Robin Renee, and a guitarist by the name of Mike Marcello. And I was actually playing bass in the band back then. I was more of a bassist at that time. So then Spy Gods led to my own project, which was originally called SNA with um, a friend of mine, Aurora, God rest her soul. And it was just acoustic guitar, me and her singing mostly Joni Mitchell and Prince covers <laughs> and a few of our originals that we were doing. Um, and then that um, amalgamated into a band 
that was called Fried Ice Cream um, with her nice. brother Francis also playing guitar and we had a, a myriad of different bass players, drummers and keyboard players. Uh, too many to name all right now, but you all know who you are. I love you. How you doing? Um, and then, uh, let's see. I also played drums. Let me not forget about New Breed with Melvin McKnight, another New Brunswick native, who you should have on the show if he hasn't been on yet. He's another great singer-songwriter. Um, I hook played, me up with his info. I will for sure. We can I do will that. for sure. Uh, I played drums in New Breed for a while. Um and then after all of that was when, after Fried Ice Cream and all of those projects was when I started Burgundy. And Burgundy originally started out as an eight-piece band. We had two keyboard players, horn section, two guitars, bass, drums, myself lead singing and playing guitar. That's so hard to get all those people together. Yeah, yeah, but it was a really fun time. We used to rehearse. Um, there was another band in town at that time called Mother Sound. And we used to rehearse over at their house in the basement. And those are really, really fun times. I, I wish I had, you know, it's always a thing. I wish I knew then what I know what now. What you know now, Because I yeah. could have really, really <laughs> been a much better musical director. But for what we were doing at the time, it was a lot of fun. And we were one of the only bands. Was that your role in that band, the musical director? And Well, the, I was the band leader. It was pretty much okay. the songs I was writing and covers. You know, um, actually, one of the keyboard players we had, Lambert, did do a, a decent amount of writing. We did some of his songs as well, but the majority of the material was uh, written by myself. And like I said, whatever covers we were doing that, at that time, which again was a lot of Sly and a few Prince tunes. Okay. And I forget what. Any else funk? Were. Oh yeah, definitely oh, funk. We love. We were born and raised <laughs> on funk. There you go. <laughs> like who? P funk, of P course. Funk, oh, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> James Brown. Yeah, right. you got to go with James Brown. Sly. Mm -hmm. Um, all every everything out of that era, uh, Rick James. You know, a, a lot of people might call that more commercial funk, but still, it was funk of the era. Uh, Bar K's cameo. You know, all those bands. Doctor John. Doctor J. You know, I didn't really get turned on to Doctor John <laughs> until later. I mean, I knew who he was. He kind of course crosses you, over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody. You know, New Orleans funk is is a different funk than Northern funk, but. Um, you know, I love it all. And I once actually, I did get turned on to Dr. John, I love his stuff. I actually saw the Allman Brothers a few years back at the Beacon. Mm. And uh, Dr. John walked out on stage and did a couple tunes with him. Of course, uh, you know, yeah. right place, wrong time. And, you know, yeah, was yeah. Cool. that Zydeco uh, thing is heavy, though, man. I love that. I actually yeah. spent a couple of months down in New Orleans back in the early 90s. And I got to see the whole before, during, after Mardi Gras thing and soaked up a lot of that culture while I was down there. and learned a lot. It was wonderful, wonderful time. Oh, good for yeah. you. So how did you get involved with uh, Mr. Macon Tells Me? And from what I see in your bio, uh, Mr. Legend and Ms. Keys. <laughs> um, you know, John and I have been friends for a long time. You know, I knew him before he, when he was still John Stevens, before okay. he <laughs> got his... Um, you know, as major label record deal. And, uh, you know, we've supported each other throughout the years. He's actually played keys in Burgundy a few times. Oh, nice. And, you know, I would play uh, guitar with him for his local gigs before he signed with Sony, uh, with Good Music, rather, a subsidiary of Sony. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they gave him a budget to put a, a band together, a tour budget, you know, he called me up and he said, hey, man, you want to go on the road with me? And um, I said, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> you like those kind of phone calls. <laughs> yes, we do. Right? Uh, how about Alicia Keys, though? Um, I have to thank John for that as well, because Kanye West, who I've also worked with, uh, they were he produced the song. I never toured with Alicia, but I recorded on her Grammy-winning song, You Don't Know My Name. That's me oh, on wow. guitar. Oh, so, so you when have they a were, Grammy. Yeah, a, a few, <laughs> oh, actually. <yeah. laughs> I got one of those. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, they needed a guitar player for the session, and John called me up. He's like, hey, can you get in the studio? I'm here with Alicia working on a song. I'll be there in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is this real? <laughs> That's great. Uh, you know, yeah, I... I uh, you know, when you're the when you're the musical director and you get those kind of phone calls, at least for me, I mean, I've done some nice gigs as a musician, you mm -hmm. know, but uh, uh, you know, when you get some of those bigger ones like that that stand out, they're gonna make people really take notice. It's always so much fun, so much fun. Yeah, you know, 
Yes. When did you, what was your what was your watershed moment? What was your epiphany when you know you were playing music since you were young? What at what point? What did you see happen, or what happened that you said, you know what, I want to be a musician. I I, I need to do this. I just always knew from the moment I was watching Elvis and Jackson Five on TV. I was like, I want to do that. So, <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, I know, like for me, I was eleven and a half and I was at a wedding I became mesmerized by the drummer my mother's cousin got married I became mesmerized I said I want to do that yeah and I had lessons and then my cousin gave me Led Zeppelin 4 for my 12th birthday mm -hmm. and I heard John Bonham and I was like okay oh, yeah. I want to do that oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and at the, it literally that album literally changed my life because then I really started to you know dedicate myself to playing and then by the time I was 13 and a half, I had my first gig, and the first applause I heard, I said, okay, this is what I want to do. That's it. You know? That's it. Of course, I haven't made it to that point yet, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I've never stopped trying, you know? Uh, John Bonham, few, st still very few come close to him. Like he, His foot and his timing, his feel, pocket, everything. I, I love him as, loved him as a drummer. Still I, love him as a drummer from the recordings. And you know? his son plays it, just like him. Or Jimmy Page mm -hmm. out. He did not lock in with John Paul Jones. He concentrated more on what Jimmy Page was playing. Mm. And you know, it was like nine eight. He was playing nine eight over Page playing four four. In I can't remember what song it was. Um, Good times, bad times, maybe. It was, mm. but it was a, a, a different whatever it was. And it was it, when you watched it broken down in musical notes. It was just like, are you kidding me? Huh. Okay, <laughs> you know? I have to go back and listen to that now. Nine eight over four. Nine four. eight over four. I gotta four. hear that. I have to look it up before you leave. I look it up on my phone. Uh, it was just if you or was see that it, cashmere. Maybe, no, I don't know. <laughs> cashmere was one of the things they discussed. But that's got a, an off timing thing too, doesn't it? it? Maybe it was cashmere. I, it could yeah, have been. I gotta listen though. I, I just I said, no wonder. I mean, because you always. Songs like "In My Time of Dying" and, mm. and um, uh, you know the, the, where he sounds like he's playing catch up, and he's really not. He's always right there, and it's it's full in the rain. It's just like amazing. You know? no. but, uh, so, no. out of all your instruments, I mean, now you're you know you're playing a guitar. Wh which one do you tend to favor one over the other? I mean, being a drummer as long as you are, is, is, is your heart still there? Or? Oh, I still love drums. I'm not nearly as good on drums as I am on guitar. <laughs> so, I mean, I probably have to say guitar is my favorite these days, but I still love to fake it on drums <laughs> and bass and keys. You know, when, when I'm recording, I, I sometimes have to do it all myself, you know, at least for the demo. Um, so it comes in handy that I can at least comp my way through uh, on different instruments, different but guitar instruments. is my main, my main dog. That's that's, that's been my bread and butter for years now. Nice. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you're just tuning in, clicking on whatever it is you're doing at home, this is one more with Danny Coleman. I'm Danny Coleman. This is Sharif Hobley, and uh, we're here talking music. The the uh, Rock New Brunswick Festival, uh, his career, his music, everything. Anything and everything. Uh, websites. Uh, how do we find you? Actually, I'm all over social. Break? I'm all over social media. I need to revamp my website. Actually, I think the the thing just went down. But I have um, M Sharif and Burgundy on Instagram, Twitter. I have a Sharif and Burgundy page on Facebook as well, and my personal page, Sharif Hobley, on Facebook. And that's pretty much where I do the bulk of my promotions. Um, through on Facebook. In Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Right. I haven't really gotten into the whole Snapchat thing yet. That seems a little young Instagram, for me, but Snapchat, I probably, yeah. <laughs> I probably well, should I thank do you it. for chiming in on my Facebook Live before Absolutely. you came here tonight. I was, I was glad. I didn't expect to see you there, but I'm glad you were watching uh, because that way you got the pregame meal from Mr. Pizza Slice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pizza Slice, a Red Bank institution with a new vibe. For over 45 years, Steve operated Mr. Pizza Slice right here on Monmouth Street in Red Bank, New Jersey. The owners have kept 100% of Steve's original pizza, which is called Steve's Original Pie. They have also uh, introduced a signature Italian hot dog and french fries. New additions include pizzas with various toppings that can be ordered by the slice, hot and cold sandwiches, 
and smaller appetizer dishes. They've kept a lot of Steve's feeling there in the classic video game machines and added delivery services, longer hours, and Sunday hours. So you can get Mr. Pizza Slice just about seven days a week. I think seven days a week, right, Nash? Yeah. They open seven days if they're open Sundays now, too? I'm not sure. All right. I gotta, I gotta look it up. Okay. Do that. We'll special report. We'll do a special one more with Danny Coleman. We'll come report. back at you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what are you doing now? You have, you're working on another disc now, you said? Yes. I'm in the middle of recording uh, my second full-length record, um, which has been taking quite a while, but I'm going to finish it if it kills me. <laughs> Where are you doing it? Um, all over the place. I recorded, it was just in Asheville, North Carolina. Claude Coleman <laughs> Jr., who's the drummer in Ween, yeah. is a good buddy of mine. So okay. we were down there, and we laid down a bunch of drums uh, so now that I have the drum tracks for a lot of stuff, I can just do a lot of the work right from home. You know, today's technology, if you got the software and a laptop, you can pretty much record Amazing, anywhere. It? it is. Um, you know, I'm still a stickler about vocals and drums being done in a real studio, though. Um, so that's where I'm at. And a lot of stuff I've started recording a few years ago, so I'm just kind of opening up those files again. Had I moved out of Brooklyn last year for some other family uh, purposes, moved back to Jersey. Um, but now that things are sort of smoothing out, um, I'm able to focus back on the recording again. And I plan to have this record finished within the next couple of months. Oh, good for you. Yeah. So we're we looking at like a November release date? I hate to put a time on it. Just Can I put it under my Christmas tree? <laughs> Prayerfully, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but. Well, you know, it, you, you mentioned today's technology. So many people are doing, you know, what you're doing. They're recording oh, yeah. it here, they're recording it there, they're recording it in an old church, they're recording it in somebody's basement, yeah. and you can put it all together. Uh, I imagine that must drive mastering engineers crazy <laughs> at some point somewhere, although they've probably learned to cope with that these days. Yeah, well, I mean, everything is, depending on your format, but even... The, in some cases, like um, I have another song called New Funk Thing that's on my SoundCloud page. Oh, I forgot to mention the SoundCloud page. Okay. Um, we did, um, we recorded some of that to tape, to actual two inch tape, which doesn't happen that often nowadays. Uh -oh. And then we bounced it from the tape into Pro Tools. Okay. So, I mean, ultimately, everything ends up digital nowadays, I think, from for the most part, anyway. At some point. For the most part. How'd that sound when you did that? Oh, it sounded great. Yeah. The tape is the warm, the warmest thing you're going to get. So, it was really fun to to lay that down. And my buddy Ben Kane, who worked on the D'Angelo's Black Messiah album. Oh, wow. Uh, he engineered that, uh, did the drums, and, and he and I mixed that song together. Yeah. Do you do most of your own production work? Yes. Okay. Is that because you want to, or is that because you just haven't found anybody that does it as well as you? Um. And what I mean by that is it's your material, so you know, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what you want. No, I, I know what you mean, you yeah. I, and definitely partly because I know what I want, but, you know, I, w I would love to get into the studio with a top-name producer. I just don't have the budget for that. Dash. Get a top name producer to <laughs> allow him some gratis time. I'll go find out. There you go. Went. See, Nash will do that. <laughs> Nash is the man. Nash huh? is All the right. man. That's right. Him and Tom, I'm telling you. That's right. I just always have to look at Nash because I can't see Tom. He's, he's probably back there giving me, like, you know, bunny no fingers. Hard feelings. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, are you playing all the instruments yourself on this? Or are you bringing other guys in? On a lot of the stuff, I'm doing a lot of it. There's a okay. few songs that I did everything. Um, a couple of songs, like I mentioned, my buddy Claude Coleman is playing drums. And, um, you know, I outs pretty much anything that I can't do myself, I'll outsource. You know, I have a friend of mine, Chris Robb, who's an amazing keyboard player, uh, singer, songwriter. He's playing keys on a few. He's playing organ on the, the single, Promise Me and a lot of keys on the other song, New Funk Thing, that I mentioned. Um, I just did another song where I had a guy, Ron Long, play some bass on it. Uh, so yeah, pretty much if there's something that I feel I can't do, then I'll call on someone who's a better 
player. Different feel? Yeah, okay. different feel. And someone who can actually play what I'm hearing. <laughs> All right. What, uh, what do you think of today's technology? And, and if you were going to give advice to bands that were just starting out or going to make their first record, what would you, what would you do? What would you tell them? I mean, I know when my son was 10, he came to me and said, Dad, will you teach me how to play the drums? And I said, no. Mm. And he said, no, why not? I said, I have two words for you. Play harmonica. <laughs> I said, you're Easier the to first carry. one there, you're the last one home. And as you get older, this stuff gets heavier. Yeah. But I tried to show him, and he had two weeks of that. And he's like, Dad, what about that harmonica? Uh, right, right. <laughs> so, so, I mean, what would you tell, you know, what would you tell young uh, musicians who are trying to record with what's going on today? Well, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, it's great that you can do all these things yourself nowadays and not have to, you know, back in the day, if you didn't have X amount of dollars to rent time in a studio and, you know, that could get very costly at 50 to however many hundred dollars an hour, depending on the studio you're working in. You know, nowadays you can just plug into your laptop and your interface right at home and there's no cost for that. However, if you don't know what you're doing, um, the sound might not be as well, you know, if you don't know how to record without making things too hot. When I say hot, I mean peak, like in the red, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, you know, so that's really the biggest challenge uh, is just getting the sound of everything to sound the way you want it. And But I, I applaud it, you know. I, uh, the Internet is great. However, now every... Tom, Dick, Harry, Mary Jane, Sue can be a music producer or an artist from their home recordings, yeah. and it, it floods the market even that much more. So you know the competition level is going through the roof nowadays. I remember when I was a kid. You know, you, you sat in your basement with the old push down two buttons on the cassette deck, you yeah. made a tape, and you sent it off and hope it got to the right hand. That's right. Now with all you do is point and click, and like you said, it's just. The marketplace, there's a bazillion bands. That absolutely, that, absolutely. Um, uh, which is why there's no record companies left. Right. They all become distribution outlets, really. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to laugh because, uh, do, you, are, do you know by any chance, are you familiar with Joe Sarasano? Mm -hmm. He was in the Trans-Siberian Orchestra and the Wizards of Winter and mm, all that kind of no, stuff. No, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra sounds familiar, but I'm not familiar. Well, Joe, uh, he's probably the most unknown rock star you ever come across he was like the voice of miller beer from 84 to mm, 90 okay. he was you know he had a commercial in the super bowl that he did voiceover work on and and uh, joe actually commented on the live video tonight and he <laughs> he said to me when he was on my radio program he said danny even the kid that bags my groceries has his own home recording studio <laughs> yeah you know? yeah and it's you know nothing against kids that bag groceries but it's a, it's <laughs> it's the truth everybody and anybody, if you have the money to buy the software, you can start to record. So you can pirate software nowadays, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, there was a guy, again, that had come on my, my, my radio program, and, and he, on his way there, used GarageBand to record a tune at a stoplight. Go figure. Go figure. And when he got to the studio, it was like radio ready. I could actually play it on the air. <laughs> it was just him with an acoustic guitar. Okay. I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, the technology is just unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, he must have did that on an iPad. Well, so, or maybe he, he did it with his laptop. <laughs> he might have done whatever, but he right. had it. Uh, it's called Zombie Zomb Zombarilla or something he called hmm. it because I can't remember. But, uh, yeah, but that's it's there. You know, first time I ever went in the studio, I was 15, and like you said, you know, two big 24-track, you know, reel-to-reel, -reel, you know, mm -hmm. two-inch tape. And yes. Was, wow. <laughs> I was <laughs> Well, the flip side to that as well is uh, it's creating a lot of bad art. Yeah. <laughs> it's creating a lot of bad art. And, you know, just because something goes viral on YouTube doesn't necessarily mean it's good. But you know, more power to them. I ain't knocking nobody's hustle. If I can get a million hits, hallelujah. Right, and, and I'll often look at that. I had, a, I had a young lady say to me once, because I used to tell her all the time, why do you keep putting these cover tunes on YouTube? 
why don't you put some of your originals out there? You got this great voice and you, you write good music. Put your originals. She says, I put an original tune on YouTube. I get maybe 700 to 1,000 views. I do a cover of something that I enjoy and I get 5,000 views. Yeah. But her whole attitude was, I'm selling me as the product. I'm not selling my music. Right. So she was figuring the more you got noticed, the more people would, you know, some of yeah. the more. Do you think that bothers, that, that that interferes with the art itself today? Where you have kids growing up thinking they can audition for American Idol or The Voice or go on YouTube and do something that's going to attract, you know, it doesn't matter how good or bad it is as long as it gets views. Absolutely. Uh, again, it's a, the sign of the times. I mean, it used to be people would seek out original music. You would go out to hear a band to hear what they their music sound like. You know, nowadays clubs would rather hire the cover bands because they know people coming in are going to know the songs that they're playing. And make you know. the register ring. Yes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, so it's, it's, that's, again, the downside and the sad part to it all. So where does a, where does a gentleman like yourself go to, to, to push his own original music? Um, well, I still Rock use those. I, <laughs> right, I still use those mediums. I still post my stuff up on YouTube, uh, on my social media pages, uh, and I try and gig out as much as I can. I do a, a weekly thing in Brooklyn at this place, Bijan's. It's more of a singer-songwriter kind of night where I play acoustic every week, and I use that as a platform to try out new songs in front of the crowd and you know see what moves people what quiets the crowd if i can quiet that talking drinking room that's a good song oh yeah <laughs> yeah that's uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of artists that they use that as a litmus test uh, absolutely you know and uh, so how do you decide what's going to go on your disc um uh, is it that That's, kind of response? Or is sort it? of. I'm still kind of going through that now because I recorded a bunch of songs and they all won't make the disc, obviously. Uh, with probably 30, 40 songs that I've started recording. Um, and we're going to narrow that down to about 10. Um, but yeah, I'll just, once they're all finished, I'll listen, see what feels best, what sounds best, uh, what works into the scheme and theme of the album you know I'm still an album guy okay so uh, you have a concept yes okay yeah so we'll, we'll do it like that and who knows the, the concept might be eclectism it might be you know that everything on <laughs> yeah, the record right. is different than yeah. the song before that might be the theme so I don't know I, I haven't decided on that yet I, I just had that discussion not too long ago with somebody about our concept albums dead you know because there are no more Pink Floyds uh, most concept albums are left with progressive rock bands, mm. and there's not a lot of them setting the world on fire these days. Y you know, so uh, there is. You know, if, if anybody is doing more concept albums, it's probably the hip hop world doing more concept albums okay. than anybody nowadays. It might not be the team themes and excuse me themes and topics that we all love, but <laughs> but there's a concept. But there's a concept. Right. Do you miss doing that hip hop? Uh, I still love hip hop, but do I miss rapping? Not necessarily. No. <laughs> uh, no. I, I think my hip hop days are behind me. Who knows? Never say never. Yeah, well, I might throw a verse in a show somewhere. You never know. You know, I, I learned that you never say never about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of those things. Uh, a, a funny thing happened to me one time. I was doing a live broadcast of a uh, a band called The Criers. And the Criers used Steve Holly on drums, who played with Paul McCartney from 78 to 81. Mm -hmm. um, but he's from a, a town outside of London, you know, from the UK. And a woman that I was playing in band with at the time is also from a town outside of London. Not the same town, but they're neighboring, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I was talking to him about his drum kit after the after he's still playing 67 Ludwigs, he still takes on the road. I was like, because I have 76 Ludwigs. I was like, well, oh, wow. okay, you know. So we're talking, and we're, you know, and, and uh, I said, yeah, I said, uh, you're about the same age as, as us. And, you know, where did you, in the London scene, and I told him about my bandmate, and he says, oh, my God, he says, I played drums on her I'm Legit record mm. that she did with DMC. And... <laughs> And I was like, 
I've been playing your drum parts for the last five years, <laughs> man. So, you know, music makes the world so small. And, uh, you know, he said, yeah, I was on that. It was a great time recording that with, with, with Zara and DMC. And, and it was just, yeah. So, uh, hip -hop, DMC from Run DMC? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hip hop and, 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 and rap and, and rock have crossed a lot of paths. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Speaking of Run DMC, yeah. I mean, they don't do that with Aerosmith. Right. There's a whole, you know, there's a whole bunch of music we just missed. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite kind of, of, of music? You're sitting home, you're relaxing. Yeah, what, do you put, I, what do you put the headphones on and say, okay? I'm old school, man. I, I love the old stuff, you know. Um, soul. Soul is probably, soul and funk is my go-to. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it depends on the mood. I love Joni Mitchell. I love all kinds of music, you know, everything. Joni Mitchell, Willie Nelson to P Funk, and on and on. Like, I have to, I have to laugh whenever um, there's a, a a woman I work with, and uh, whenever I see her in the hall at my day job, I, uh, I go, "What's going on?" She's like, yeah, you know, tell me what's going on. <laughs> and I said, "Kids today don't necessarily get it," yeah. you know. Yeah. That's probably one of the most classic concept yeah. albums of all time. What's going on? Right. Like, so <laughs> exactly. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, music sets moods, mm -hmm. and it's just a little bit of everything. It, it it can either make or break your day, really, in a lot of ways. Yes. Um, what does your music do? If you had to describe your music, who are we shooting at here? Uh. I would love for everybody to love my music. Uh, it's not necessarily for any one crowd. Um, I, I try to focus on positivity and and. Um, so you got a youth message. Uplifting messages, if you will. Okay. Um, also, a lot of love loss since I'm real good at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I. You know, I, I don't limit it to, oh, I write my music for this demograph or that demograph. It's for okay. everybody, anyone who wants to accept it. What was the biggest the biggest gig you ever did? I mean, if you when you look back, did you have something that really... The biggest gig? To you, it was like the most rewarding, fulfilling... Hmm... That's, that's a tough question because, you know, I also play in my church every Sunday, and that's very fulfilling every okay. week. Um, but if we're talking about in the professional music world, I would probably have to say playing the Grammys with John Legend. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had some really uh, fun times, great performances uh, when touring with him. I toured with him for the better part of five, six years, including the year before he signed his major label deal seven years um but yeah playing there we played in italy and duomo in front of like a million people that was phenomenal um what's that like to play in front of that see that's a bucket list item for me the quote unquote bucket list it was, it was great it was phenomenal like you know for me those kinds of shows are easier to do than a small intimate coffee house <laughs> you know because you're on this big stage, you're you know you're presented as opposed to right up in your face, uh, you know. Yeah, and there's a pit between <laughs> yes. you and the audience. Yes. <laughs> so, uh. Um, yeah, but I, I probably would have to say those moments. And yeah. and we played in South Africa with some great shows. I, oh, wow. I toured with Rufus Wainwright, and we played the Sydney Opera House. That was amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so those would probably have to be the top three. I don't know if I could narrow it down to one. <laughs> That's okay. That's good for you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank uh, you. Almost as amazing as these pastries. <laughs> segway, segue. <laughs> Antoinette Boulangerie, specializing in creating delicate and sophisticated works of art. <coughs> Excuse me. Using only the highest quality ingredients. Located right next door here to Mammoth Music at 32 Mammoth Street, in the heart of downtown Red Bank, they are a fully operational bakery with all of their baking done on premises daily. In addition to their handmade variety of croissants and Danish, Antoinette's offers a dizzying array of traditional French pastries, macaroons, cookies, and savory treats. 
find them at Antoinette Boulangerie. And I want to thank them because every week we get this dizzying array. Right, Tom? He's not even paying attention now, <laughs> see? And he wonders why I go to Nash all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Nash, who made the pastry face today? You? As always. <laughs> Nash is the pastry face maker, if you look at that from the aerial view. Uh, uh, can we get the view from the chopper? The chopper Do we have yeah. a drone in here so we can <laughs> see the pastry face today? <laughs> uh, yeah, but I want to thank them for that and the Karatha coffee that we have out there every week. Uh, Antoinette Boulanger. Yeah, those I kind was of fooled. You're saying blue lingerie. I'm like, ooh, lingerie. <laughs> right? I got Stop it. in there and get a gift for somebody. Exactly. I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> what was your, uh, those gigs like that, what was the first one you ever did? And were you nervous? Uh, I, you know, it all because, again, if you can remember it all, it ain't rock and roll. I, before I started touring with John and worked with Alicia and Kanye, I had already been working in the music scene for a good 10 plus years, uh, working with a lot of the groups out of the Philly music scene and the OK Players scene, um, that umbrella, uh, with the Roots Camp, um, uh, Jazzy Fat Nasties, Kindred Family Soul Band, Jaguar Wright, Music Soul Child, Floetry, Vivian Green, um, you know, I even played with Jill Scott a few times, like, you know, I had already been working in that that scene and playing Essence Festival and things okay. of that nature. So, you know, um, uh, as God would have it, you know, we just started the career, just started escalating. Um, so it, it was all great. It was all new to me. You know, I yeah. did my first first European tour with um, Mark Anthony Thompson and a band called Chocolate Genius. And Claude, again, from Ween, was on drums, and another good friend of mine by the name of Oren Blodow on guitar, and I was actually the bassist on that tour. But that was my first introduction to touring, you know, through Europe, through Eastern Europe, and, okay. and it was just fantastic, you know. We played a little small club in King's Cross, London, called Water Rats, and, you know, it was, you know, a little divey bar, but it was Fun is, you know, I don't want to cuss. I know we're on the air, but yes, it was a lot of fun. To this day, that's still one of my favorite tours that I've ever done. So we know we've already established that the bigger gigs are a little easier, but the coffee houses and the little bars where you get to interact with the yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. can be a little more, you know. It can be interesting. More, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little more intimate. Intimate yeah, right. as always can be good. I remember doing a gig one time, and this guy was dancing, and out of nowhere, he took his, he had Cuban heels on. Mm. Big, chunky heels. Took his shoes off and hooked them over top of the wedge monitor on the floor and danced in his socks and went home that way, left the shoes with the band. Wow. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> That's an I want some of what he had. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, there's all kinds of weird stories like that. Um, so I know we touched on it a little earlier, and I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but uh, let's talk again about Bob Macon. What was your experience with Bob that's led to you playing Rock New Brunswick? You know, I haven't... I, don't, I, I think I might be correct in saying this. Uh, I recently met Bob through through this whole Rock New Brunswick thing. I think I may know Bob from way back when, but I'm not sure. And we is the one who got me. Tenth. Yeah. To me. Position. Um, Ernie Isley, who learned from Hendrix. Um, Curtis Knight, um, the Isley Brothers. Footage um, I saw them in the backup um, band. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so funny. You never. If I say Jimi Hendrix, that's not what comes to mind. You, you know. I mean, I didn't realize he had. That's where he started out. Yeah. Because um, you don't. You know, after playing that and then doing what he was doing, you know, you wonder where that switch got flipped. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, one of my. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, he was a guest on my show and became a friend of mine. And he's a, a, a friend of this store, actually. He comes in here very often, uh, Vinny Martell mm. uh, from Vanilla Fudge. He said, if anybody ever finds these tapes, they'll be worth a mint. And he said, because one night, you know, 
him and Hendrix, and they, they went back to Electric Ladyland Studios after they were at a party, and they just started jamming. Mm. He said, we have no idea what happened to the tapes, but if anybody ever mm. finds them, he says, somebody's going to be rich, because we just, you know, they just laid down track after track after track till the sun came up. Wow. You know? So, don't be neat to find that. Yeah. You know? Well, who was engineering the session? I would start I, there. Yeah, right. Start there and find out <laughs> what happened. Uh, but, yeah, so, <laughs> them, them, some of them recording studio. I'm a writer, and I've, I've talked to a lot of guys and recorded. All the good stories start out. Yeah, it was about 2 in the morning, and we were still screwing around in the studio. And, you know, uh, like Randy Backman telling me that the, the – the keyboard part taking care of business mm. was played by the pizza delivery guy. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were all in there, you know, they, they, it turns out Steve Miller was the one that ordered the pizza a couple doors down the hall. Mm. And, <laughs> and the guy's like, hey, I really like that. Do you care if any sat in? And somebody had the smarts to record it. Then the next day, they didn't know who did it. And they had to call around every pizzeria to see who had made oh, a wow. delivery to the recording <laughs> studio. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, any, any, you have any stories like that from when you recorded or? Uh... I mean, mistakes happen all the time that are kept, you know. Uh, I, I you think, ever use them? Oh, yeah. Well, I think a good mistake can make a, a track sometimes, you know. Sometimes that thing, it's a fresh concept to what you're trying to do, you know. Uh, and I tend to not like things that are too perfect. You know, I like a little grit and a little dissonance here and there because that's how life is things aren't perfect all the time um, uh, so yeah I, I like that and late night recording is when I get some of my best work done you know after everything's done and I can just go close the door in my room and be quiet and well quiet around but loud in the headphones and I'll be up till five in the morning sometimes just laying stuff down and editing that's pretty much been recording. the MO lately yeah. that's you know it always uh it amazes me today how the industry itself has gone from what you just said to everything has to be perfect. You know, you have programs like uh, Auto-Tune and Perfect Pitch and um, uh, uh, Grand Funk Railroad, the, the drummer, uh, founding member, Farmer, mm -hmm. right? Don Farmer? Don, yeah. He said to me, he said, one time we were listening to our old Grand, he goes, I listened to the old Grand Funk albums, and I hear the mistakes. But we kept them. He said, we kept them because it gave it character. Right. You and know? it might have been a mistake, but it might have just felt right, you know? <laughs> right. You know, he said, and I go back and I listen, oh, well, we know it's there, and most people don't. But, exactly. You know, and, but it gave, he said, and that's what's wrong with music today, there aren't enough mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people are too perfect. It's too sterile. It's too clean, yeah. and it's too. Yeah. Uh, I, I I kind of agree with them on that, because mm. uh, I don't think I haven't come across any bands in quite a while that have staying power. You know, who's Jimi yeah. Hendrix today? We're still listening to Jimi Hendrix. He's right, still influenced. Right. He's been You're dead make, for... Make me answer that. I'm going to make a lot of people uh, mad. <laughs> and, and that's my point. There's, there's, there's you know... When, yeah. when I was growing up, you knew that... You could just tell by the radio, even if you didn't know that. What is that? It sounds like The Stones. But I got a new album out. You know, what is that? It sounds like, you know, Eric Clapton. And, you know, I've been heavily into blues music now for probably the last seven or eight years mm. and uh, you know my Pandora is set to like B.B. King's Blues Channel and um, you know some some of the older blues like collections that they speak of and you know you'll hear the same song played six different ways in the course of two hours you know, by different artists they all have different interpretations right right you know same one four five chords but right. they have the, these different interpretations um, but yet every one of them is good. <laughs> uh, why do you think it is that, that, that they... I know why record companies used to do it. You know, there was a sound and it worked, so we're going to make everybody sound that way. Mm. You know, uh, but you look back at things like the old... Take the old Motown, right? 
Crew? Was that the Wrecking Crew? Was that them guys that recorded? Who was the Oh, uh, the crew? Funk Brothers. Or the Funk, right. They were all on the same... The Wrecking Crew was the other one. The, they were all on... The, they played just about on every Motown artist. They were the, they were the studio band. Yeah. Yet they managed to make things different. Why do we fall into what seems like cookie cutter music now? Why does every singer songwriter now tend to want to sound like Jack Johnson or or Ed Sheeran or you know? I I don't know. I guess you know it's, it's like the uh, old record company con concept. I suppose you know if 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 that formula works, then they just try and make carbon copies of what worked. You know, everybody's trying to sound like Rihanna or Beyonce or, or, or you yeah. know, or Ed Sheeran or you Taylor know Taylor Swift. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, that's not what I'm trying to do. So, <laughs> Joe, uh, are you familiar with Joe Lewis Walker, the blues guy? No. Joe Lewis Walker told me one time. He says everybody's point of reference. Yeah. You know, and what they pick up from from music. Yeah. You know? So what was your point of reference? I mean, you had the family, and you had, obviously, you had talented siblings. Uh, uh, cousins, mostly. I only have one sibling, my okay. sister, uh, who doesn't play any instruments, but we did grow up singing. Oh, so your cousins were the Smith brothers uh, uh, at the beginning. The, yes, my okay. grandparents' last name is Smith. Okay. So my mom's maiden last name is Smith. Um, so, yeah, it was me and cousins who had the, the Smith connection. Um. I forgot my train of thought there, but uh, yes, I started. I started in church, so I guess that would probably be my basis or my point of reference: gospel music, okay. gospel oh, and soul. Right. Yeah, that's where I learned about harmony, and uh, you know, I played key piano uh, in church when I was younger, and drums. Uh, so that would that probably would be where the basis comes okay. from. Joe Lewis Walker is a is a blues guy. Influenced by you know like Buddy Guy and so on and so forth, and he said he always I always crack up when I I hear people say yeah you know Stevie Ray Vaughan you know Mary had a little lamb he was like no you know Buddy did that first hmm. you know and he said for me Buddy was my point of reference because that's what I knew you know these kids knew Stevie Ray Vaughan right so I guess it's it's generational oh absolutely know? absolutely I can remember listening to my parents' music and remakes of the songs that I heard as a kid coming out of their, you know, stereo system. You know, 10 years later, 15 years later, another band was redoing them. I'm thinking, all right, I like that one better than that. But I remember the old version, so you right. know you get torn. Oh, with, absolutely. With the quote-unquote point of reference. Um, I was torn with this one, I won't name names, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but <laughs> one of the guys in the band, uh, it was when John Mayer had come out with the the live record he did with uh, Pino Palladino and Steve Jordan okay. as a three-piece, which is that performance was really good. Uh, and cover of is Wait Until Tomorrow in there. And, you know, a lot of the guys in the band were younger than me, and um, I think one day I was sitting on the bus playing it in the back room or something, and, and somebody said, oh, yeah, that John Mayer song. And I was like... Oh. <laughs> we won't. <laughs> exactly. There's your point of reference. Right? Yes. For them, it was John May. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, what do you have coming up? What, what's your schedule look like, uh, New Brunswick? We're play, I'm playing uh, Saturday at a place called Barca City, uh, which is on 47 Eastern Avenue in New Brunswick. Okay. We played there uh, last month, and we had a, a really good turnout, a really good time. So they're having us back. So we'll be there this Saturday, starting at 9.30. I'm doing um, uh, the AM radio show on Thursday morning. Um, and we have another performance coming up in Brooklyn uh, later in August. And then there's the Rock New Brunswick, the Hub City okay. Rock Festival on September 10th. September 10th. Yeah. Um, and my Tuesday, every th uh, Soul Acoustic Tuesdays is the event that I do at B. John's Brooklyn on 81 Hoyt Street in Brooklyn every Tuesday. We get okay. started about 10. And I, I hesitate to call it an open mic, quote unquote, because we get some really, really good talent that come through. You know, when you say open mic, it scares a lot of people away. Yeah. But we get some really, it's more of a showcase, if you will. Uh, we get some, some, like I said, some great 
singer songwriters, good talent coming through there. Yeah, you mentioned Claude Coleman from Wayne. He's seen or found on the New Hope. Okay. And, oh, no kidding. Yeah, and Chris and, Harford still plays. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> Mickey used to play with us sometime. And Claude would, you know, when those guys weren't on the road. But yeah, we had a band called Angel Dust, <laughs> and we used to play. Uh, we used to play John and Peters on a just about a weekly basis. John and Peters, yeah. I remember they used they before they stopped people from smoking down there. Oh my God! Yes, God, you, yes. You could, you could literally cut it with a knife. <laughs> yes, you could. Right, Sharif? How tall was that ceiling? You, you couldn't wear that hat and stand up no, on stage. No, no. You know how many times I hit <laughs> my Nash, head on the thing duck. going up to the dressing room? Yeah, right. Oh, off the steps, <laughs> yeah. you back it there. <laughs> I can remember setting up my drum kit. It was only a five-piece Ludwig, you mm. know. But, but I had on a, that stage, a, that was half back, the stage. Right, my back was against the wall, and you know, I'm, I'm boom stands like practically. <laughs> I was like, oh Jesus, yeah, fun time. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of fun there. You know. Yeah, uh, I think he's still doing a Wednesday night jam there. It's called the Invitational. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, people think they don't get, as you put it, they don't get scared away because. It's an open mic, but you have to be invited up to play. Yes. So you can't just show up with your guitar or harmonica. You know, you have to get there, and yeah, yeah. somebody has to invite you up. So, yeah. And you would think it's kind of clickish, but I was in there one night some months back, and wow, the talent was just... Yeah. He invited me down again a couple of months ago, and I'm so mad at myself that I couldn't do it, but I was, I, I was heading uh, out on the road to LA to play with Vivian Green I believe and I had to renew my passport so I couldn't and it was like the last day to get it done and the flight was the following day it was just no way of getting around it so I couldn't go but I was so upset because Mike Hampton was there that night you know and he's like oh, I'll get you down and send a car to pick you up you don't have to worry about anything just show up with your guitar oh. and yeah yeah but it's all right he and I recently talked and we have some things on the horizon I'm excited about oh good yeah, good, good, good. yeah you never know who's going to be in New Hope mm -hmm. you know between the winery around the corner which has national touring acts and okay. Havana and John and Peters and so okay. on and so forth well, the hour's up, sir. Ah, oh, is it? That and was quick. You, I told you it'll go quick. <laughs> um, and you were going to perform for us. Yes, and, I am. Uh, while you're doing that, first of all, thank you very much for uh, considering everything that Oh, Thank happened. you for having me. I thank really appreciate for, it. Thank uh, you for making the trip and, and hanging out with us here. Uh, if you're just clicking on or tuning in, this is One More with Danny Coleman. This is Sharif Hobley, and he is going to play some music for you. And I'm going to get myself up from the chair here. Put on my glasses, and I'm going to talk about Mama's music. I'm going to go see Tom while you're getting yourself ready. So uh, I'm going to come on over here and see Tom. Tom! How are you, sir? Oh, good. I'm just wonderful. Wonderful. Established in 1987, Mammoth Music is located in the center of his historic Red Bank, New Jersey. Voted the third best town in the United States by Smithsonian Magazine. Located within walking distance of the famed Count Basie Theater, Red Bank train station, and many fine eateries, Mammoth Music continues the tradition of being a destination store for musicians of all levels from beginner through professional. The new owner, Mario Di Bartolo, who we cannot thank enough for allowing us to set up shop here every week, he's a lifelong musician himself, that, and he offers a wide selection of brand name instruments at everyday low prices both new and used, with personal, professional, and expert service that only a family-owned and operated store can provide. Does the neck on your guitar or banjo need repairing? How about the valves on your saxophone? Do they need to be refitted? Bring them in, regardless of what day. Bring it to Monmouth Music for quality repairs. You'll enjoy prompt service from a team of repairmen who are always available. And uh, right now, we're going we're gonna to cut it back to, uh, to Sharif. Sharif Hobley, who will be playing Rock New Brunswick, September 10th, uh, part of the uh, the event sponsored by Making Waves and uh, Rock on Radio and Carousel Arts and and many others. So, uh, right now, Sharif.
than I ever did before. And Lord, please don't leave me now. I need you more than I ever did before. So I pledge my love. This is the, the latest single titled Promise Me, available on iTunes right now. chatter going on somewhere.
Thank you. Step over here and grab this because that way you can have that. Sharif Hobley, everybody. Thank you so much, Sharif, for taking the time. Thank you, Danny. I really appreciate being you here. Likewise. You program tonight. Uh, <laughs> there was something I thought of while you were playing, and uh, now I can't. The, the the thought train's been derailed. <laughs> <laughs> there was one other thing I was going to ask. But uh, where can we get your music? Uh, my debut CD, Bubby's Love, and the new single, Promise Me, are available on iTunes. Um, CD Baby, I believe Amazon.com as well. But iTunes, if most people have iTunes nowadays, you can go there. Uh, or Spotify. I'm also streaming on Spotify. But okay. the uh, the newest single is available on iTunes. Fantastic. Yes. All right. And again, uh, Rock New Brunswick, September 10th on the main stage. You could see Sharif. Uh, now, you mentioned earlier a trio. Was it a trio? You said we're playing? Um, well, I have a four-piece band oh, now. Four piece. We, we okay. added a keyboard player to the mix. I, right. I finally found my guy. So, yes. And this Saturday at Barca City, August 19th. There you go. Sharif yeah. Obley. All right. Next week, we have the uh, the Turnbucklers. So, uh, they'll be in here next week. Uh, another uh, Bob Macon band. So, uh, tune in for them guys. And uh, come back next week. And we'll have one more. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>